welcome to Raven Art Renditions, and we are talking with Hendrik again. How you doing, Hendrik? Good. How are you, Andrew? Pretty good. I uh, yeah. got back from my cruise in one piece, even though the hurricane came came uh, came a little in front of us, and yeah. Now I don't need to do that for a while again. <laughs> yeah. You talking about Hurricane Sandy, or are you talking about the American election? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the election was after we got back, but yeah, uh, at least, we probably shouldn't talk about that. Well, at least I don't have to listen to any more of the ads for a while, because Wisconsin <laughs> is one of the swing states that just gets bombarded by ad after. Oh yeah. Ad. <laughs> yeah, I watch a bunch of shows once a week on American politics, and you know, it was getting painful there for a while, just waiting for that election to finally happen. Yeah. And, you know, the next day I'm already reading about 2016 election. Oh, just, I know. And it's I th- like, don't tell me you're talking about that already. I'm pretty sure the ads are going to start for that next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. Things are a little... Uh, a little less involved than that for elections in Canada. It's a, it's a lot quieter. Yeah, <laughs> That's because we only have about 10 people in the whole country. Oh. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're anything but quiet about it here. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> when I, and I was I was in a different area, obviously. You know, Florida has a lot of the same ads, but they're, you know, because I was there, and they're a swing state, too, so they have a lot of the ads. But some of the other states along the way, there's some people that were on the cruise with us that are saying, yeah, they don't have ads at all because they're not a swing state. They're pretty much decided. And I'm like, I'm moving next year during the election <laughs> and then right. back when we're done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's amazing, all the coverage and all the money being thrown around and mm-hmm. yeah, it's crazy stuff. Yeah, it's... Yeah. Anyways, it's over. Now you got to see what, what happens in the next four years, eh? Pretty much. Wait and see, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So we had a we had a giveaway on the last uh, last DVD that we had a chance to talk about, and the 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 winner was seemed to be happy to get it, fill it out the same day. I'm glad that we did that, and uh, if if uh, everybody listens, they'll find out how to enter for the uh, the next one at the end of this one. And and this DVD is the hand planing te- techniques DVD. Right. Yeah, the one we talked about last time was specifically about tuning up hand planes and chisels and how to sharpen them. Mm-hmm. And then this next DVD <clears throat> set, which is, again, five discs uh, called Hand Planing Techniques, this one is just specifically how do you actually use these planes. Mm-hmm. It's not about chisels. It's about planes. And, uh, yeah, it's one thing to sharpen it, but it's another thing to put the whole plane together, know how to use it for different kinds of tasks, know how to, um, you know, set the blade up correctly in the body, how to what kind of plane you should choose, what angle you want to use to, you know, effective cutting angle. So there's mm-hmm. there's tons and tons of info in there. Yeah, and you, now one part of it on I think it talks about it on on DVD two where they go between the bevel up and the bevel down planes. And you mentioned effective cutting angles. Right. I guess first, is there a huge difference in the effective cutting angle when you're talking about bevel up or bevel down? Well, <clears throat> because one, first of all, when first of all, when you have a bevel up plane, mm-hmm. you're you're likely to have either a low angle plane, mm-hmm. which usually has a 12 degree bed, mm-hmm. or a regular angle or standard standard angle plane, which has a 20 degree bed. Okay, so that's that's one part of how we calculate the effective cutting angle. Mm-hmm. The other part is what angle you grind the blade at. Yeah, and you add the two together. So <clears throat> with the low angle block plane, if you sharpen it to 25 degrees and you got a 12 degree bed, that means you, you have it set to cut at 37 degrees. Yep. Now that will do a great job on end grain, but it will tear out far worse on long grain. So in other words, planing the end of a board is fine, but planing the edge of a board or the face of a board, you're going to have massive tear out if you're going against the grain. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, you always try to plane with the grain if you can, yeah. but <laughs> as we know, the grain often switches in so many different ways that you can't possibly keep turning around. Uh-huh. So, um, yeah, so basically with the bevel up planes, we have control over the effective cutting angle we have depending on the bed we choose, like which plane we choose and how we sharpen it, whereas the bevel down plane, the bevel's on the underside of the blade, so the effective cutting angle is actually the angle of the frog itself. So that's sort of a fixed number. Yeah. Most most planes, it's 45 degrees. Mm-hmm. 
So when when obviously you said end grain is a big time with the with the um the bevel up planes. Yeah, with the low angle block plane. Or or sorry, it doesn't have to be a block plane, but it has to be a low angle plane of yeah. some kind. Yeah. yeah. And I myself I own um let's see. There's a I guess you'd call it like a jack plane and there's I've got a number of a regular old time Stanley number five, you know, with the four forty five degree frog and I have a low angle jack plane. And I don't even remember who made it anymore. And then I've got a standard angle and a low angle block plane. Yeah. So, and like you said, I've I've seen times where, oh, this is perfect. It does exactly what I want it to do. But you hear all this stuff about everybody's only, some people switched over to all bevel up planes. And some right. don't want any of the bevel up planes. They want all, all bevel down stuff. Right. <laughs> I guess. There's uses for both of them the way I see it, and I guess what's your opinion on that one? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have I have a few uh, bevel up larger planes too, you know, like a bevel up jack mm -hmm. or a bevel up smoother, and then I have also the block planes, which are bevel up. And um, if if the effective cutting angle of a bevel up plane happens to be 45. Uh, 45 degrees, let's say. Sure. And if your bevel down plane has, you know, just a normal sharpening angle on the bottom of the blade, mm -hmm. no back bevel on the back, then you're also cutting at 45. Yeah. Um, both planes will pretty much uh, act in the same way in the wood mm -hmm. if the effective cutting angle is the same. What you will find, though, is that, first of all, the two planes feel different. Uh, in the way it's used, because the low angle one has a very low center of gravity, mm -hmm. and with the with the bevel down one, um, because of the f higher frog angle, it's a totally different feel. It's sort of like you're pushing down into the wood more rather than forward more. Yeah. And I don't know. I think that the feel of it is more of a personal preference thing. Mm -hmm. But you know, there there are some downsides to the bevel up too, like. One of the big marketing points, of course, is that you can sharpen the blade to any grinding angle you want or sharpening angle in order to get different effective cutting angles, which is true. That's, that's a wonderful uh, thing that you know, makes it really flexible. Sure. But on the other hand, um, because the bevel up plane is bedded at only 12 degrees, when the blade starts wearing on its underside, mm -hmm. I find that the plane stops working correctly sooner. Okay, in other words, there has to be a certain minimum angle behind the cutting edge. It's it's known as the uh, clearance angle. And because you only have 12 degrees under there with the bevel up, I find that, you know, as you start wearing a slight sort of back bevel behind the cutting edge, the plane stops working. And unfortunately, when you go to sharpen your blade, you now have a back bevel on the flat side of the blade, which means it's harder to get rid of. You, you basically have to grind the bevel Great. part of the blade back further sure. to start fresh as opposed to maybe just doing a light honing. Oh, okay. You know? So I, I find that the bevel up is very flexible, versatile. It's great. Um, but I still, it, it's not like, okay, these are so good, I never need to use a bevel uh, down plane anymore. I, I really love my regular, everyday number four smoothing plane, you know, bevel mm -hmm. down. Yeah. <clears throat> So I, I find that, uh, you know, this is something a beginner probably wouldn't pick up on, but mm -hmm. after spending so many years using them and honing them and everything else, I find that the bevel up ones take a little more work to sharpen between uses. Um, but, you know, again, might be worth it based on the versatility of it. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's nice for someone who's on a tighter budget to maybe buy one bevel up plane, but to like buy one extra blade. And you can sharpen two different blades at different sharpening angles so that you have uh, a plane that will perform well in long grain and end grain. Oh, right? sure. Yeah, that so makes there's sense. There's that flexibility, but uh, there's definitely some downsides, too. Mm -hmm. right? And I, Really, people should go to, a, you know, go to a woodworking store where they have both, and I'm sure they'll let you uh, test them and try them. And some people seem to like one over the other in terms of comfort, too. Mm -hmm. And I, I like my... Um, uh, my bevel up plane on honestly where I use it the absolute most at the bevel up jack plane is on my shooting board. Okay. It it seems to just 
work perfectly with what I want to do on the shooting board. You know, you just take the couple thousandths off on that miter and bang, it's right there. It it, it, right. it hugs the corner. It sits perfect. It, it feels right. I don't have the frog in the way. I just I can hold it perfectly. I'm like, yeah. that thing's always on the shooting board. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I somehow find when I'm using a plane for a long time, doing something like leveling a, a tabletop, mm-hmm. I find that uh, the bevel down plane for me seems more comfortable when using it for a long time. Oh, okay. Uh, I feel like as the blade gets duller, it requires a little more downward pressure with your hands to keep it cutting, you know, because you're mm-hmm. too lazy to go hone it again. <laughs> and and the bevel down one sort of naturally uh, transmits more downward pressure from your hands into the wood compared to a bevel up. Mm. Because the bevel up is generally bedded at a well it's always bedded at 20 degrees or 12 so it's a much lower sort of angle sure. in the body like compared to a regular frog and that means that there's more of your hand pressure transmitted parallel to the wood surface not as much downward and it's almost like uh, as the blade gets duller the plane blade starts riding out of the wood surface more because you don't have enough downward pressure. I, that's what I find. Okay. But again, like we're talking about really subtle things. Like oh, yeah. You have to use a plane a lot to even notice some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I always say it's kind of like handing me a $200 bottle of wine. Like, don't even bother. Because, <laughs> you know, unless, unless you're an expert on wine, you're probably quite happy with the $20 bottle or the $15 bottle and don't know the difference yep. at all. Yep. <laughs> but, uh, you know, with hand planes, you need a plane that's, good enough to perform well but there's probably no point in spending ten thousand on one plane (laughs) even though they exist uh you're not going to be experienced enough to appreciate what what the difference is anyway Mm -hmm. i i like my old stanley's all cleaned up they work just fine (laughs) yeah yeah, and that was you know that was the point of the other video series uh, or set that we talked about last time was that you know you can take an older stanley or or record plane or whatever and tune it to perfection, and it will work as well as a high-end plane. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, after tuning up one or two, maybe you get a little fed up of it, and you want to treat yourself by a really nice plane that's ready to go out of the box. So yeah. It's, you know, it's wonderful to have something like that, too, even if it's just one or two or whatever. So. Yeah. Cool. Anyway, so, yeah, there's lots of choices out there, but, uh, you know, I'm not the kind of person to say, well, now that bevel up larger planes uh, are so prevalent, I'm just going to throw away all my bevel downs or sell them. <laughs> I, I do find still that my, you know, my number four, my number five bevel downs are still kind of my main go-to planes for, for more everyday tasks. Mm-hmm. And uh, the bevel ups, you know, have their place, but I, I don't find uh, that they, you know, they definitely don't replace the other ones, that's for sure. Sure. Cool. Well, in one of the other DVDs, you uh, one of the DVDs in in the hand planing technique set, rather, um, you you talk about the flattening of tabletops and other panels. Right. So, I guess one, if if it's not going to fit through um, any of my equipment, obviously, if it's mm-hmm. if it's wider than what is thirteen and a half inches, I found out is the biggest I can put through my my uh, uh, my planer. Yeah. Or if there's twist and cup with it, you obviously can't put it through the machinery until you get at least one side flat too. So right. that's yeah. part of the reason you might want to do those things. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's uh, that's always the problem. Is you even if you have a big planer, like I've got a 20 inch planer, I still have only an 8 inch jointer. Mm-hmm. So you know I would I would rarely glue boards together that are wider than 8 inches anyway because of wood movement issues. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I'm using jointer and planer to mill my individual boards. Then when I glue them together into a panel, it's now going to be wider than the jointer at least. Yeah. So if the glue up goes exceptionally well and one side is re- really, really flat, or both sides if you're lucky, <laughs> then, then I can just go straight to the thickness planer and use it for both sides after the glue up. But if the glue up didn't go as well as you hoped and it's kind of cupped or twisted, it's too wide for the joiner, so I can use the hand plane just to level one side, mm-hmm. then the planer for the opposite side. And then there are panels that are wider than the planer, and I have to hand plane both sides, like usually tabletops or larger yeah. you know, larger panels like that. Mm-hmm. So you really can't get around the hand plane nope. for that kind of thing, no. I, I find. Yeah. 
uh, unless you're just building tiny panels for you know little doors and drawer fronts and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think the the average hobbyist jumps straight onto a belt sander because they just don't know how to use planes or how to sharpen them properly. Mm -hmm. Uh, once you know how, you know, you, you don't want to use such a noisy and dusty tool if you can do it by hand with a nice sharp blade. So <laughs> and there it's is, all about what you know, right? There is something about a nice pile of shavings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's impressive to, you know, walk into my shop when there's uh, shavings up to my ankles all, all around the bench. <laughs> but, you know, like there's this, <clears throat> I think we mentioned it before, at the end of every video series I have a, thoughts on woodworking little section there yeah just a few minutes talking about each thing <laughs> each idea and one of them i call fun for about an hour <laughs> yeah <laughs> and when, when i teach people i tell them hand planes are wonderful um if we're trimming dovetails or we're trimming you know fine joinery or maybe a pegged mortise and tenon joint and you're just trimming the pegs mm -hmm. that, that kind of planing i could do all day and have fun mm -hmm. But when it's, okay, here's a tabletop that's 48 wide and 102 inches long, and I want you to hand plane both sides flat, mm -hmm. it's fun for about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> after an hour, it's just hard work, and at the day the day after and the day after that, you know that you've been using muscles you don't use every day. Yep. Because <laughs> you're sore, and, and, you know, that's that's to me not fun planing. It's too much of a good thing, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, anyways, there's a, I think, I think a lot of planes are sold and, and maybe even planing videos and stuff on the idea that it's this romantic, wonderful tool that, you know, you just got a huge smile on your face the whole time. Uh, there, there is that side of it for sure, but there's also the side where you're just hogging away at some wood for seven hours sweating all over the place and <laughs> it's hard work and that's the only way to describe it yeah so. well it's 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 one of them where i know even myself when when there's there's some of the boards that i send through the thickness planer you know you, you get them and you're like wow this i can't even send this through it's it's not flat enough on one side to even do this with and the work that you do a time after time and you're like I'm glad I got this thickness planer to do this other side because I don't want to flatten this whole thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, any time I build a panel that still fits through the planer, you know, it's a joy. I mean, I, I kind of have to, like if I'm teaching somebody, I kind of have to have them use the plane um, for a while and, and work hard at it in order to appreciate the machinery I also have <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> when it can be used. Yeah. Some, so sometimes a student will come in and they say, I want to build a table. Uh, like a small table, like an end table or something, and they say, I, I want the top to be 21 inches wide. And the first thing I'm thinking is, my planer's 20. I'm going to talk them into making it 19 and 7 eighths wide. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll explain why, and they'll say, well, what does it matter, one inch? Well, with that one inch difference, yep. we're going to plane that top in about uh, five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and if we do it by hand, it would be a great lesson on hand planning. Like if that's something you want to learn, great. But <laughs> I could spend two and a half hours teaching you that alone. Oh yeah. You know. <laughs> and, I mean that's something in this video too that, you know, you might find kind of boring at times. The uh, the chapter on uh, leveling tabletops, you know, it's quite long. Mm -hmm. I think it's over an hour long, mm -hmm. which is, seems insane. But um, you know, you, you have to make a decision between showing you realistically how it's done, like showing you the real thing mm -hmm. versus just showing three minutes worth and then just fading out and saying, look, it's perfect now. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I just don't believe in that. Like, I'm not going to show five hours of it because you'd be bored out of your mind. But the point in the video was, let me show it to you in real time. Mm -hmm. Obviously, some editing was done, so it's not totally mind numbing. Yeah. But, but I'm actually, you know, showing you, okay, this is a high point. This is a low point, like showing you with a straight edge and feeler gauges. And now I'm going to mark the high points with a pencil. You know, mm -hmm. things that I, I might not even do when I'm doing it myself, but I'm just trying to make sure the camera picks it up. Sure. And say, all right, I'm going to mark here, and then I'm going to cut here in this direction, and I'm going to curve my plane around in a little circle here and this is why and you can see the pencil disappearing in those areas that were high and not in the areas that were low mm -hmm. and uh, you know I'm very careful through that whole sequence to make sure you understand exactly what's happening to the surface and why and where to push the plane and how to hold it and everything else so yeah 
to, to, like if your wife was walking through the room, she'd be bored out of her mind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but if you're into woodworking and you've tried doing it before and didn't do so well, you will be interested and you will appreciate that kind of detail there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's, it's not so simple. I know. I know from doing some of the flat, you know, or actually from attempting to do some flattening before I took uh, um, my the first class that I had uh, up in Minnesota on, on on starting to flatten some boards, and the the one on one stuff and being able to see somebody do that and go, oh, okay, that's what you mean by the okay. Now I understand what's going on. It makes a huge difference, and you think you're doing something, and then you see it done one time, and you're like, well, that makes sense. Why didn't I do that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's uh, you know, like when I do one of my seminars here, and it's live, and everyone's crowded around watching. You know, I I might spend half an hour or more doing one task, but, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, nobody's like bored out of their mind just eating their donuts in the corner. (laughs) (laughs) They're all, they're all crowded around like, oh yeah. Well, wait a minute. Why are you pushing it there? And why are you turning? Why are you going cross grain, not with the grain? Or, you know, there's so many different nuances to it. So it's not, uh, it's not, and and the, the thing about it, I think we talked before, I mentioned, uh, how I kind of recommend that, a beginner start with machinery and then move on to the hand tools. Mm-hmm. And it's because the, the learning curve for the hand tools is so incredibly steep by comparison to the machinery that, um, you know, I have to make sure that if I'm teaching someone that they're kind of eased into it. Yeah. Because, you know, the worst thing you can do is throw something at someone that's so complicated that they just don't succeed and then feel like they're a loser and, why did I ever start this hobby? <laughs> Maybe I should sell all the stuff I buy. Uh-huh. You know, and sort of, I want them to succeed, and I kind of have a view that the hand tools should come second because the learning curve is too steep. You need to have a little more understanding of everything first. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, and the the but the other thing on the other side of the, of the coin is that there are lots of things I do where the hand tool is the only tool that can do it. Yeah. And it, and it really is the best tool. Like there, there are times where my planer can do it or a hand plane, and I'm going to pick the easy way out no matter what. Mm-hmm. But there are lots of things where I need to just trim some little joint, and really the hand tool is the right tool. It's the best, it's the quickest, it's the safest, and everything else, right? Mm-hmm. Like just uh, just last week I was working on uh, a new design on, on an armchair, and I designed this, uh, it's hard to describe, this sort of, multi-beveled front section on the arm kind of a diamond shape and one of the bevels on the corner is beveled in three planes if that makes sense like so in other words instead of like a compound angle Mm -hmm. where you would have your miter gauge angled and your blade Mm -hmm. to do this cut it would require the miter gauge angled and the blade and the wood angled too so in other words, the part would actually be riding on a single point across the table saw top. Oh yeah, I don't think I and want I, to cut that. <laughs> no, and, I, and I'm not kidding. I spent probably an hour trying to think of some way to make those cuts on either my table saw or my bandsaw, uh-huh. and finally realized there was just no easy way to rig it up. <laughs> and I, I basically just drew it with a pencil on the arm, like exactly where the layout lines needed to end up. Uh-huh. And I grabbed a low angle block plane because I was I was planning basically downhill on a very mild taper, mm-hmm. uh, so it's basically an end grain cut. Yeah. And uh, I'm not kidding. I I did each of those cuts probably in about four or five minutes. I only <laughs> have to do eight of them. <laughs> so you know, 40 minutes later or whatever, I'm done all of them. And I already spent an hour scratching my head trying to figure out how to do it with a machine. <laughs> yeah, and 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 to do it on the machine, it probably would have involved making a very elaborate jig to use that exactly. one time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I you know, I have a tenoning jig, so I'm trying to t- angle the fence on the tenoning jig, <laughs> plus angle the blade, plus angle the you know the rear support on the tenoning jig and the fence. Mm-hmm. And you know, there was no way the tenoning jig would adjust the way I needed it to. And finally, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it the hard way, and it turned out to be the easier way. Because <laughs> I, I could, you know, I'm only taking off one thou at a time, so I'm not able to hold my plane at the perfect angle mm-hmm. as I'm working, but I can see 
that I'm slowly going too far this way and not far enough the other way, and I'm just changing the angle of the plane, ra like um, not randomly, but um, slowly as I'm working and paying attention to the three different layout lines, and eventually ended up in the right place. Yeah, so, cool. But very subtle stuff, you know. Neat. Yeah. So, yeah, so anyway, the machine is sometimes, uh, you know, I always go with whatever's the quickest and safest and most enjoyable kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you got a panel wider than your planer, you got to do the grunt work, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that much fun. Yeah. Well, it's got to got to get done somehow. And, exactly. And now the the next DVD, DVD four, that I haven't had a chance to look through yet, and I'm looking forward to is. Um, you talk about and just some of the things mentioned in here that I'm looking online is you know leveling edge banding and, and flattening minored frame and doors and, and leveling end grain on dovetails and figure joints. I mean that DVD I, I've I've liked the three that I watched prior to that and that's the one I'm that and actually seeing what you say for fun about an hour on the thoughts. Those are the two I'm really looking forward to seeing. <laughs> right. Yeah, the flattening tabletops. I mean that. That I mean, in the video, I did a small tabletop. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a dining room table. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the interesting thing is um, my first DVD, 2007, called Jointer and Planer Secrets. In that one, I make a small tabletop. So I show you how to use the jointer and the planer to mill all the stock, how to edge glue it. Mm -hmm. And then that's the end of the video, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the number of emails I got after that going, well, what do you do after that? <laughs> and I said, well, that would have to be covered in another production. It was already four and a half hours long, right? Uh -huh. that, was, that was my first one, the shortest one. Sure. I thought that was long back then. <laughs> and, and I said, well, obviously, that's going to have to be later. Like, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, the video had to end somewhere. I can't show you the entire process, including building the legs and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, Anyways, so everybody thought it was purposely a cliffhanger <laughs> so that it would be covered in the next video. But the next video was a whole other topic on table saw, right? <laughs> so finally, this year's video um, basically takes you back to that tabletop. <laughs> Not the same one, but the same size, like yeah. 16 by 37 or something, or 32. Uh -huh. And I show you, oh, do you remember way back five years ago <laughs> when I ended at the glue up? Well, here's where you go from there. And, <laughs> and it's finally covered here, right? That's okay. I know some people that probably have projects that have been sitting that long to go <laughs> to that next step anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah, probably. Yeah, I should have set aside the exact same panel five years ago and saved it. <laughs> there you video. go. <laughs> But anyways, but that that chapter on flattening tabletops, you know, it's it's very necessary stuff oh, yeah. to learn. Yeah. But it, but it is kind of, you know, kind of dry because you're doing a fair bit of planing that's kind of repetitive. Um, but then we go into chapters uh, nine, ten, and eleven, and I start mixing it up with, uh, you know, you, you glue some iron-on edge banding onto plywood, or you glue some solid edging onto plywood. And, you know, obviously when you're done gluing it on, it's proud of the surface on both sides. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we plane it down without damaging the veneers as well? Yeah. Um, so I, I cover the iron-on and the solid, and then I also cover one where you have edge banding on the front of the board and the end of the board, or the panel, hmm. coming into a miter in the corner. So how do you deal with that? Because you got opposing grain directions at the corner often. Oh, sure. Like they could be moving towards each other or away from each other, mm -hmm. but um, you know each each situation requires a different approach at the corner, so you don't damage some wood or you know break a piece off. Yeah, blow it out and have to figure out how to fix that now. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of interesting. And then you know, and then I in chapter ten, then I'm covering how to flatten a mitered frame. So for example, you make a picture frame. Or it could be a frame and panel door with mitered corners. Mm -hmm. Or it could be a tabletop, like a coffee tabletop with mitered corners and a glass center, like a glass panel in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we hand plane that, which is basically a large version of the solid edge banding that comes to a miter in the corner. Sure. But, but now we have four miters to deal with, and we have some of the boards in that frame have opposing grain directions halfway across that one board, Plus, we have different combinations of grain direction at each corner. Mm -hmm. Like at some corners, I have to plane from the inside of the corner out. Other corners, I have to plane from the outside in. Or I could actually go in a circle around from one board to the next, depending on grain direction. Huh. 
So it's all like another refresher course on how to read grain. Yep. Uh, you know, we do close-ups with the camera. Let me show you this board. The grain's running this way. So I put an arrow on the board. I actually did it with a marker for the video so you could really see it mm -hmm. to show which way you're supposed to play it on this board. And this board's the opposite way. This board changes direction midstream. And I mark it all up on both sides of the frame. And then I show you in major detail, like, how are we going to attack this thing without getting carried everywhere? Cool. You know, so I mean, I'm using uh, bevel down planes. I'm using bevel up, like I used the Veritas bevel up smoother at one point. Mm -hmm. I'm explaining how sometimes I want to play in a certain spot, but my plane can't get in. Like, in other words, it's a hollowed area, and I'm trying to cheat. I'm trying to save myself a bit of work, but I, I can't get down into a hollowed area with a longer sole because I won't go in. So I'm switching to a short little black plane just to cheat and go down in the hollow mm -hmm. and, and sort of, you know, get it. Close enough, maybe not perfect, but close enough with less work and less time. Oof. And then I also show you how to do it, like to more to a higher level of perfection with a bigger plane, but it takes longer. Oof. You know, so there's all that. And then chapter 11, uh, leveling end grain, which is one of the hardest things to do. So the examples were, um, um, I think I just had an example where I'm just doing end grain, mm -hmm. but then I did dovetails and finger joints. Mm -hmm. So you're leveling all these uh, proud little areas of either fingers or tails or pins mm -hmm. and showing you how do we plane that down with a low angle block plane without damaging the wood around it which is long grain mm -hmm. and tears out worse with a low angle block plane if the grain's the wrong way yeah and then you're also trying to stop blowout from happening around the perimeter of where you're planing like if you go out towards it uh, or from the wood off it yeah you're going to blow a corner right off mm -hmm. so there's you know just Plane directions, how to hold it, use use of backer boards too at point at times. I show how you can do that, and uh, yeah, there's a ton of detail there. Yeah, and that and that stuff. I mean, you know, the the flattening the tabletops and the setting up of the planes and all that stuff is is stuff that you know there, there's there's circumstances where well, actually, I guess the the flattening the tabletop is more than the you know there's circumstances where you you simply can't do it on the machines that you have, and it's good to know these right. things and and to know how to do it right. But the you know all of DVD four seems to be anybody who does woodworking deals with this stuff. No matter what woodworking you do, yeah. you can make little boxes to 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 huge cabinets, and it's you know you always have that kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh hey, cool. Yeah. Every project, I'm going to be able to use some of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in Chapter 12, then I went into some other, um, this is part of the bonus footage, I went into some other situations, like you've got some, uh, maybe you want to put a little chamfer around the perimeter of a drawer, mm -hmm. but it's such a small chamfer, it's not really worth rigging up a router bit. Sure. So let me show you how to just do it completely by hand, and it really is very quick. And then I did slip feathers. Some people aren't familiar with that word. I think it's like an old British word. It's basically when you have like a spline, in the corner of a picture frame or the corner oh, of a box. Oh, I was going to ask you what a slip feather was because I haven't had a chance to see that DVD yet. And I was like, what's yeah. a slip feather? Now I know what it is. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll see that name in British uh, woodworking books, but okay. you don't hear it so much in the U.S. or Canada. Here we usually just say spline. Uh -huh. It's like a corner spline you've glued into the corner of a box or picture frame, and then you cut it, cut off the excess later with maybe a flush trim saw. Mm -hmm. But maybe your flush trim saw doesn't cut perfectly flush. Sure. Yeah, they usually don't. So there's a little bit left to do by hand plane. Mm -hmm. And I actually, in that section of the video, I purposely cut this the spline like a sixteenth higher than the surface just to show how to do the whole thing by hand. Oh, cool. You know, like someone might not have a flush trim saw. Mm -hmm. So they might use something like a Jizuki saw or even a jigsaw or something. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to cut close to the surface and possibly damage it. So they might want to leave a good amount of wood and then do the rest by hand plane. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, yeah, so I try to cover, you know, lots of detail. But I know if I put out this video series on how to use a plane but didn't have the other video series on how to, uh, yeah. Sharpen it. <laughs> sharpen it. Like, and set like, it up. <laughs> yeah, like if if you only know how to sharpen but not use, then then it's useless. And if you only know how to use it but not sharpen it, it's also useless. Yep. <laughs> uh, but there's so much there. You know, I, I pretty much had to have ten DVDs, like two different five DVD sets, to cover the whole range. I thought. Mm -hmm. 
when so, I and uh, I, I think they cover them. Even though I haven't been able to watch all of this one yet, I mean I'm I'm looking forward to seeing the last the last two that I haven't been able to look at the the last two DVDs. So I'm looking forward to seeing them, and I think you cover it all pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, like the other thing, you know, I always try to have bonus footage in each uh, DVD series. Mm-hmm. So in, in the first one on sharpening, I showed how to sharpen a shoulder plane. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't show how to how to sharpen it. What I did was, um, oh, I'm trying to think. Somehow I touched on the shoulder plane in the first DVD set. Yeah. But there wasn't really time because it was such a specialized uh, plane to get into every detail of shoulder plane setup because it, it's quite different. Mm-hmm. So in the in this one on hand planing techniques, there's a bonus chapters, chapter 13, just on how to sharpen shoulder planes and set it up. Oh, okay. And I think that's over an hour too. Yeah. Like, you know, a lot of these chapters are the length of a normal DVD just for the one chapter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, cool. um, yeah, there's there's tons of stuff there. I mean. You know, I, I have a good customer of mine in uh, New York State, and he buys all the videos. And he bought these two new ones, and he watched the whole thing. And he said, I've watched it all, but I didn't really observe it yet. <laughs> <laughs> like, he knows from experience that you can't observe it all yeah. in one watching of it. So I said, that's all right, you know. You, you got the general gist of things. Now what you want to do is just set it aside and... If you're building a tabletop a month from now, you're going to just watch the one chapter on how to flatten. You're going to sit down for an hour. You're going to watch it. You're going to do your own tabletop while, you know, kind of in between watching it. Mm-hmm. And next time some finger joints come up and you're wondering how do I level these things, so you're going to fire this into the DVD player again, and you're going to go just to that chapter. <laughs> and re- really that's how you have to do it because you can't you can't absorb it till you oh, actually yeah. do it. You, you can kind of listen to it, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's it's going into your brain and staying there. So, and and, and the, our Thanksgiving down here is coming up, and the Monday after Thanksgiving, I have off. And I, yeah. what I'm what I'm doing is, I'm actually getting um, a different cable system than we cur- currently have, a, a different okay. TV system. Um, and when they're going to wire that in, it is no additional charge to put a wire into the shop. Okay. So I've been looking forward to getting a TV down here anyway, and I'm going to revamp the little area where I have the stereo and put a TV and a DVD player. So I'm looking okay. forward to being able to actually see some of this when I have the tools in my hand once in a while pretty yeah. soon. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got students with TVs, and then I've got some that just take a laptop into the shop and put it in the uh you know, in the C D drive and, mm-hmm. that's, that's, and watch it. That's the one that way. the one thing I'm I don't do in my shop other than when I'm Talking to you on, you know, talking to somebody on the computer or doing the live cast, the computer don't go in the shop because I work on them all day. I don't want them in here. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, remember, there's two different ways to make uh, make your family sleepy on Thanksgiving. You, you can either serve them turkey or you can fire up one of my DVD sets right after you eat. <laughs> right after. Either way, right after they're going to be knocked out. They're no good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Then maybe. Yeah, we already had our Thanksgiving here quite a few weeks ago, but uh, I know yours is coming up next week, isn't it? Yep, next week. Next week Thursday we get to. And we're gonna we're going to attempt to uh, uh, deep fry a f- turkey for the first time. So yeah, I've, I've always wanted to do that. Oh, my. I, I think I think I saw a show about how to do it by Martha Stewart maybe like 15 years ago, and I always wanted to do it since seeing that. And it was I think it was two. Two or three years ago, my wife got me this. It's uh, basically the setup for being able to deep fry them. And, and what I've been using it for is, uh, and I have an old cast iron pan, and I deep fry fish outside on this cast iron pan. And I'm like, well, we have this thing. We better try it. <laughs> so, How much oil you got to put in there? Um, as far that's as the only thing that stopped me from doing it is how much oil you got to put well, in. Well, the, the way I've been told and, and read about it is basically you put the turkey in the pan, in the pot you fill okay. it with water you take the turkey out you dump your water into something you can measure the water with and that's how much oil you need <laughs> right but i mean are we talking like uh two gallons of oil or something well i'm not sure i'm gonna have to figure that out a lot. yeah i'll have to let you and the next time that we have a chance to, uh, <laughs> to talk i'll let you know how it turned out or if we had to go to mcdonald's for thanksgiving yeah. <laughs> You might you might want to stuff it just so you don't have to fill the middle with oil too. <laughs> <coughs> yep. 
that's that's going to soak up another half a gallon right there in <laughs> yeah, the side. <laughs> yeah. So oh, next time I'll have to let you know how the turkey turned out. But yeah. You well, know, uh, for some reason in our family, uh, we're more into the white meat. So I actually just buy turkey breasts. Oh, there you go. And I, I, if the weather's still decent, I, you know, because our Thanksgiving's in October, mm-hmm. um, I'll barbecue them. I'll have the whole thing done in less than an hour and a half. And most people have a five, six-hour turkey going in the oven all day, right? <laughs> there you and, go. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty tasty and and quick too. So I I know for for years my uh, a good friend of mine used to get a turkey for Christmas at the, oh, yeah. the place he worked. Every year they got a turkey. Okay. And uh, then it's um, I can't remember which holiday it is. I always get them backwards. Memorial Day and Labor Day. One's early, one's late. But the later one that we yeah. have, we always grilled the turkey. And and we gr- grilled the whole turkey on this giant Weber grill that he had. <laughs> and, like a rotisserie? Well, it it sat on the Weber grill and sat we, on the grill. Yep, put it oh. on the outside. We we put it in a pan with certain stuff. We just kept putting butter on top the whole time. It was one oh. of the best turkeys I've ever had every year, and it was the cheapest oh, yeah. that they could buy to give them from work to. <laughs> yeah, so like indirect grilling on on top of the pan. Yep. So. Yeah. Yeah, just like an oven, basically. Yeah, it worked great. <laughs> yeah, you need to have a big barbecue for that. It was, yeah, that was a big grill. We just sat and drank beer all day waiting for the turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Six, seven hours later. <laughs> yep, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's why it was so good. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> by, the time, by the time you had your fifth or sixth drink, you could have, could have given you anything. You would have said it was great. <laughs> great turkey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, like we talked about before, if anybody wants to uh, have a chance to win this DVD, and this is the <coughs> excuse me, hand planing techniques DVD from Hendrick, uh, make a comment on the post that this um, audio video uh, podcast is part of on my site at RavenheartRenditions.com, and you'll be entered to win, and we'll be giving it away at the next live cast. We're not sure right now if the live cast will be in December or January. We're still working on scheduling for that, but watch the site okay. and you'll find out. <laughs> Good. Yeah, once you know the winner, just like last time, just send them to my site. They fill out the order form. Uh, just put in uh, Ravenheart winner or whatever code you gave them, and yep. then uh, I just pop it in the mail the next day, and they'll have it a week later. That sounds great. Cool. Yeah. Well, hey Hendrick, I'm I'm looking forward to finishing up this finishing up these DVDs, and uh, we will talk to you again soon. Thanks again. Okay. Well, have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. Bye. Try not to go to the mall. <laughs> no, on the day after the mall, <laughs> I I avoid everything that day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Talk to you later, Andrew. Thanks again. Bye bye. All right. Bye. <laughs>